So we've got a really interesting program today. Uh, we've got a lot of amazing people joining us here from really all around the world. Um, and so there's going to be a lot to cover. This is a lot of people. Um, so feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, we certainly want to have some time for live questions uh, to all the panelists, but also if you have general questions as we're going, feel free to enter those in the question and answer. Uh, we can get to them as, as we have time. Um, and I'm also going to try and get that chat working. Apologies for that. Um, but so really, this is about painting the idea of what's possible when we start working with water. What's possible when you use this approach uh, that we teach as part of water stories. And so just really briefly, I want to give some big picture what's possible, what we've seen as far as some of the best examples around the world, what smaller examples look like. Um, and, you know, we really have this amazing potential to create really a rich wonderful paradise landscape everywhere. Uh, so this is a project of Sepp Holzer in Portugal called Tamara. Uh, and this is the water landscape that was created there, just with natural materials, just with the rain from the sky. So you can see just by working with these natural forces, we can really change how a landscape functions and how productive that landscape is. Uh, this is Sepp's original farm, the Kramagerhof, just an amazing example of how humans can partner with nature and produce a farm that is really economically viable, that's environmentally regenerative, that's beautiful, that's healthy, that's a joyful place to really live in. And then we see these big projects like in India with Rajindra, where you see this village running out of water. And then just with these simple water features, water harvesting features, that community can go from nine hectares of agriculture to 650. Uh, and they've not only done that in small communities, but over a region, they've revived seven rivers, they've reduced the temperature two degrees Celsius, they've returned the seasonal rains. And then you see other examples like Peter Marshall in Australia implementing these same kind of techniques. He had fire swirling around him for two months. Uh, and his property was one of the only ones that didn't burn. But so it doesn't have to be these huge grandiose things. It's really important every step we make forward, it impacts the landscape, it impacts the wildlife. We can do nice, small, simple features, catching the rain off of roofs of buildings. Uh, we can create farms that have struggle with water scarcity and provide springs for drinking water water bodies for irrigation water, terraces to help infiltrate that water. Uh, and then in a lot of situations, we can take resources like this, a spring just tapped and drained down the landscape and turn it into a water body. So this landscape that used to be so rich, they wanted to just drain the water away. Now it gets dry for long periods. But in that same landscape, you could actually have tons of water abundance just by holding it throughout the year. Similar kind of setup. This was a farmer that without the water feature put in down at the bottom, this farm would have failed during a really long two year drought. Uh, but actually, not only did it not fail, they had more production than ever before because they had stored the water from a time when it came. Uh, and similarly in Oregon, a place gets a lot of water for a short period and then not much at all for a long period. We can turn these pastures that are really poor, don't grow well, and then we can hold that seasonal water, charge it into the landscape, and make rich pastures where it once was dry. So this is a dry valley that doesn't hold water throughout the year, and then these are the types of water bodies and features that can be created there. So it's just to paint a little bit of the visual language of what's possible with these kinds of transformations. Um, but we have here with us today five students of the previous round of the course or the current round of the course um, that have all really shown as far as what they're doing for water as advocates, as stewards, as professionals, really taking these learnings, taking these approaches and spreading them within their community, spreading them on the ground and spreading water into the ground to create a rich, wonderful place. Um, so for starters, I'd love to hear just from each of you guys, uh, for the participants, who you are, where you're joining from, just a little bit about your background, and then, you know, what brought you to Water Stories? What 
did the core course help you accomplish? What kind of experiences have you had as a result or what kind of projects have you engaged in as a result uh, that have helped you move towards a better relationship with water? Um, do any of you want to get started or I can put someone on the spot? Okay, Gerhard, I had you first on the list. Uh, you're on, yep, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay, so I will start. Uh, <laughs> I tried to sum up what I wanted to say and it's just too much. So I will just uh, give a brief intro. Um, I'm Gerhard, I'm living in Austria. I'm co-founder of a quite huge eco village. Uh, a former military base that we try to transform in something useful. You can imagine that there is a lot of water running downstream from all these concrete and buildings. And that's my task at the moment to, to get rid of this past damage that has done, basically to figure it out again and to do a good thing. I'm actually living like just 15 minutes from Sepp Holzer and I never managed to see him so far. And actually, I'm pretty happy because, uh, Zach, I'm sorry, but I have to say, I really like the way you did the course. Um, it's so humble and you are so patient. The same question comes again and again, and it's worth listening it the third and fourth answer because it's every time something new is coming in. So I really enjoyed this, uh, not only the content, but also this uh, question and answer sessions. For me, it was the the most powerful part to have all these people sitting there, seeing their faces, especially Thomas, who is also here. For me, it was always the best to see his face. I knew oh, this guy is really working on the same track as me. And yeah, every week it really gave me this uh, drive that I needed to get through it. I mean, it's a job to do, to do all the course. And yeah, it's good to have the community around. Um, yeah. What have I done so far? I mean, I, I did some things before in this echo village. I tried to kind of copy what I saw in Tamara, what I learned from Bernd Müller. And I was like, yeah, let's do some swales there. And hey, I could do a pond. And actually, I didn't really have the perfect idea of how do I do this? So I would I would need some somebody to ask. And this course came just in the moment when I realized, okay, I need help. <laughs> I need I need help. I don't know how to do this uh, pond. It's too big. I have no idea. I, I need to check it out and to really learn and understand the details also. That's what I use this, all these sessions for. And But I got more. I got also this, um, this community, like, as I said with Thomas, but also even more, we had this German talkers group in, in, in the software where we are communicating a lot. We even met physical some, some of us. Some of my colleagues even came over to build a pond with me. Um, like this, the global community to be really connected with these people that are like-minded, that are working in the same thing. And also a more local community to really work together, try to find out how to get started. I mean, it's a, it's a journey. and. Yeah, I have some clues and hints and we are really working cooperative in it. It's not like competition. It's just, hey, let's get together. We are here, let's do something. And yeah, this is it where we are at the moment. And where am I, where I am at the moment is I'm implementing these bits and bytes that I learned and that I saw. I did some things I'm not so proud of, uh, but I think I did what the course is intended to. like. I started it, I did something, I asked before, I understood what I'm doing. I failed in some points. <laughs> I learned from it and I continue. And I think this is the main thing that I really take from this course. Start doing it, start small <laughs> and start doing it. And be sure that there are others that are with you. This is uh, what I can say. And yeah, tomorrow I'm going to press the button to start a crowdfunding campaign to have more of these water retention features implemented in our place to really get it done as an educational place to bring in people to do workshops to kind of 
start my business from home and, and get it, letting the people know, getting uh, into contact, consulting more and listen. And also to do some really physical in the ground. It's healthy, it can be exhausting. <laughs> and I will not do too much of it. I think it's also in Austria, especially a bit of a law issue all the time. But I love it to really see the things that I have done. And I'm really curious how it plays out. Will I do more of the consulting part? Will I do more of workshops? Will I build? Will I be like Zach in some years and drive around diggers? And uh, yeah, we will see. This is this is open for now. It's a great perspective. Yeah. Vielen Dank, Gerhard. How about um, Nick? In the interest of saving your solar panels, why don't we why don't we hear from you next? Uh, yes, thanks a lot. Uh, yes, my name is Nick. Uh, I live on Tenerife, just off the coast of Africa, a small island. Um, originally, I'm from, from Hamburg, and I studied in the Netherlands and Amsterdam, so water was never really an issue for me. Um, but I moved here, I think, around five years ago for the first time. And I moved to different farms where I did volunteering, just learning, getting my hands dirty, because I've always been interested in, in nature, I kind of stumbled across permaculture, regenerative agriculture. Uh, yeah, that rabbit hole was, was pretty deep. And uh, when I moved here, I realized that, wow, on the farm, we only had uh, 280 millimeters of rain. So I think uh, that's around 11 inches, uh, which is really not much. And usually it came down within just 10 days of the year. Um, so also super difficult. And there I really learned to capture every drop of it. And I learned about the importance of really using water, really appreciating it. And then I started uh, running small experiments, like just running around with a shovel when it was raining and just trying to capture it and infiltrating it into the ground, got really into it. And then from there, moved a bit more onto, onto bigger projects, where we also had some, yeah, some small machines involved. Um, and I tried to read all the books, do all the courses I could find and realize, okay, water is such an important issue. And this got really deep in the last um, three years, I think, uh, because I'm also uh, working a lot uh, with Climate Farmers. It's an organization we've been building over the last years in Europe uh, to support farmers who want to transition to more regenerative agriculture and to build resilient farms. And especially over the last year here in Europe, uh, there's been an extreme drought and more and more farmers are realizing that uh, there's just not enough water or in some cases when the water comes, there's too much of it at once. Um, and so these, these extremes are really, really tough for the farmers and they're the first to notice it. And yeah, if, if we don't manage our water well, um, we're pretty screwed. So we won't have anything to drink. We also won't have any food. Um, yeah, so, so that's for me, it's really clear water is the deciding factor if we want to continue living on this planet. And yeah, then the course just came along at the perfect time because I felt like, okay, I've been doing a lot with the shovel, but I really want to know how, how I can take this to a bigger level. I want to support farmers. Uh, there's just not enough people out there in Europe uh, and globally as well who, who can do this kind of work. So I wanted to dive deeper into it. And for me, I, I can only agree to Gerhard uh, before that uh, it's the community and these chats that we have next to the course content. So the content is there as an incredible starting point, but then just having the chance to, to ask, get deeper, and really think like, okay, how big does my dam wall need to be? And what consistency of clay is right? And do I do the spillway this way or that way? And it's it's just incredible that you can ask all these questions and get deeper into it and the community part. And also there, I think uh, we have some really cool projects now lined up for next year with uh, some of the farmers in Portugal and Spain. So we will visit their farms, support them in water management on their farms. Uh, get that going and also there the community comes in again so we'll work on some of the projects uh, together with uh, Oliver Gaucher of the Regenerative Skills podcast uh, I guess all of you know the podcast it's incredible but also we've been speaking with Lorenzo Costa another member of the course and we're planning projects uh, also in Italy and yeah it's, it's incredible so a lot of projects are coming up and it's just great to know that there are people on the same path people you can ask and yeah, if you feel unsure, uh, you don't have to do it alone. And I think that's that's the most important part uh, of the course for me. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. 
Well, let's see. I, it'd be really great to hear from uh, Giselle or Julia next. Who would who want to go first? Julia, you're outside. How about let's hear let's hear from you. Hello. Good morning. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Julia Eden. Um, my background, uh, well, for about the past decade now, I've been working with native plants, primarily edible plants of the Pacific Northwest, um, but plants in general as well. And um, I've been a fan of Sepp Holzer for a fair number of years now. Um, and actually right before COVID, I was lucky enough to just happen to go to one of uh, that talk. And um, he was the first person I'd come across that was actually practicing Holder's methods in real life. So I started following him. And so when the course came up, I knew it was perfect because I had been struggling with how to take the theory and put it into action. I just, I couldn't seem to make the leap um, for as much research as you're doing, like actually getting out into the land and doing things and knowing what direction to go was really a struggle. Um, so yeah, the course popped up and I got really excited and um, I went full bore into the professional pathway, but pretty quickly figured out that um, Advocate was actually just a better suit for me. I will probably go back and finish professional at this point though, I am planning to, but um, I, I found that, you know, part of this course is you, um, you learn a lot about yourself, about your strengths and your weaknesses and where you can go, what your direction can be. And um, yeah, so I, I found myself really drawn to the education side of things more than anything else. Um, and so, yeah, I got a lot of direction out of this course. I got a lot of confidence and understanding. I really understand the concept now in a way that I didn't before and gives me a confidence to speak to things, to answer people's questions, and even have the confidence to say, I don't know the answer, um, to, to, to know that it's okay to not have all of the details. Um, that all kind of come from this. So during the course, I started a couple of projects. Um, one of the things I'm doing now is uh, just a basic landscape design for my brother's suburban lot. So that's an interesting challenge because it's very limited in terms of the watershed as a whole, what I can <laughs> affect. So um, we're kind of looking at it a little differently. That's um, interesting. But the big fun one is um, the 42 acre farm that I live on the owners want to turn it into a uh, like an outdoor school and um, I get to do the design for that so we are breaking ground this spring with our first pond and um, it's going to be my first ever earthwork moving project and I'm really excited to get going um, but a little bit more than that again I got drawn to education so I've been focused on presentation seminars building workshops things like that I'm really trying to develop a class or a library of um, tools for education that I can use to, to give to the community. And um, that has kind of led to a lot of networking and a lot of unexpected experiences from networking. Um, I'm in contact with some local firefighters and other people that work in like the firefighting industry. And it looks like I might have a chance to affect some local policy in my community at some point. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and then uh, actually, also through this ended up, it looks like I'm probably going to be a board member for a nonprofit that is starting up. We're just um, in the early phases now, but that's looking good. Um, so that's like a fun new project that'll be taking up some of my time pretty soon. Um, and yeah, so my, my goals right now, I don't really have any there. Everything's very malleable. I'm very excited right now about I have all these ideas, all these different avenues I can take. I'm putting out all these feelers and just seeing what comes back. And I'm getting such positive responses from so many different areas that I wasn't expecting um, that it just makes the future feel very exciting and open. And I actually just wanted to tell a quick story that kind of sums up, I guess, what I've gotten from this course and um, um, sort of the transitions that can happen because of it and things like that. So anyway. Um, I was handing out flyers for a presentation I was doing, and I was in a small store, and um, the woman seemed kind of hesitant to take the flyer, and she was a bit standoffish, and she sort of, right at the beginning, she said, you know, I'm so sorry, I don't want to shoot the messenger, and I was like, oh, God, what's coming next? Okay, <laughs> and, um, you know, I thought it was going to be a very uh, kind of 
negative conversation, but she she ended up giving me an in really quickly. Our community has been pretty devastated by wildfire. We've had a bunch of evacuations and the community is uh, fairly understandably not very happy with the fire department at the moment. And she thought I was associated with them. So I used that to kind of turn the conversation around. And then I started asking her questions and I wasn't getting mad and I wasn't pushing my agenda. I was genuinely like asking her about her situation and responding with information that she wanted and not the information I wanted her to have. And I was watching her face during the conversation and I could see her going from thinking I was an enemy to thinking I was a friend or, you know, an ally. And um, by the end of the conversation, she looked at me and she's like, oh, so you're the person we need. And I think that might be one of the proudest moments in my life. So um, I wouldn't have that experience. I wouldn't have that understanding without the Water Stories Core course. So thank you, Zach. And um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Awesome. That's that's a super good story. Really inspiring. Um, and each of you guys, I mean, it's been just really amazing. And, uh, you know, you were just some of the, all of the people in the course are so incredible. And uh, it's just been really awesome to see all these small victories really start to add up and stack up as far as spreading the awareness of what's possible when it comes to water. Uh, Thomas, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Tomas Garcia. I'm from Chile. I live in the central part of Chile in the coast. So it's, we have a Mediterranean climate. Um, so one thing that's quite interesting of Chile is that it's so long and, and thin that you have like three big different climates. So it's like we would be living in three different places of the world. So there's a lot of uh, challenges to understand those three places. So um, I just wanted to say that because in the context of, of, of being like a, a water steward or working with it, which is something that started uh, 10 years ago, uh, through different places, different practices. Um, I, I, I've, been, I've been working with, uh, with the earth and with plants uh, for a long time, but there's not much uh, formation in, in that properly. So uh, I'm, I'm an engineer as a base uh, study somehow. And, and all my, my travel with water started like, like the, on a big, um, I went. I started going deep on it when I was in India, and I read Seb Holzer's book uh, from the Search of Paradise. And one day after, I was <laughs> directing machines uh, with Indian people in a language I don't know, <laughs> with the knowledge I was barely understanding. That created like a huge bond. <laughs> uh, so that that was like. Uh, my first attempt of it because there was no more, not, not much um, information or places where to uh, go to look for that. So um, I, I've been following SEP since then. And, and the minute I saw this and following SEP means getting into SEC and all of uh, what you've done in the web. <laughs> so thanks for that uh, as a first thing. And I, I've, I've always been trying to uh, put myself like in service of re restoring the land. Like I think that, I don't know what comes first, like restoring ourselves as human beings or restoring the land for us to be able for restoring ourselves as a human being in, as a part of a, a whole system. So what comes first? And, and the minute I, I got into this uh, place and, I, and I've been able to uh, take as much as I've I've been able, in <laughs> uh, the course itself, it's been such a beautiful uh, journey with like the whole process of, as some of, uh, of, of the panelists have said before, like not only to know yourself and what are your abilities and what can I do or can I not do yet or what are my strengths or my weakness. So where to put myself in the puzzle for being able to achieve what I want to achieve. That's been really, really powerful. And, and what you just said, uh, Zach, in terms of a small wins somehow, like it's, it's not like read all the books of the world, see all of the videos you can find in YouTube, whatever. It's like, go and get your hands 
30, as Nick said before, and start testing what happens. Like, what happens if I do this, if I do that on a small scale? You better screw it up when it's small and not when it's huge. So I think that there's been such a good uh, guidance in this process towards that. And, and those small wins, as Julia said, like with that, it makes you so proud of yourself. Like, oh, yeah, I made it. <laughs> You have this whole community of people that we've never seen. None of us, uh, most of us, we haven't seen each other like in person, but we get together and say, hey guys, I tried this and this happened and everyone cheers you out or says like, oh, something's quite alike happened to me. And, and so this kind of community creation on the process, it, it's beautiful. Like they get our setting and it's like, seeing the eyes of the, the, the rest of one and say, oh yeah, he, he's really what I felt or she's doing what I did. <laughs> I think that is such an important uh, part of this whole process. And, and I, I mean, I, I appreciate it and, and, and I'm grateful for, for those uh, community sessions somehow. And I think that one of the things that, that I risk the most of, of having gone through this course is the, the empowerment that create for us human beings to know ourselves as uh, potential parts of the solution. And it's not something that a huge company or only a huge uh, government could do. Like we, like all of us can do something. Like it's, it's not, uh, it's not that there's, there's nothing in our hands. Like everything is in our hands. Like, and our hands are all of what it is somehow. So uh, that kind of empowerment, it, 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 make so much sense to me and, and it's something so important in in my perspective to transmit to the rest of the people with this knowledge with these examples with things that you can see you can touch you can feel like this empowerment it's it's amazing so yeah i'm i'm, I'm super grateful for what it's been and, and also super like uh, concrete things like take care of the budget and how to do it like there was a, a, a really a real before and after, like we had that session. So uh, I, I've always been like super hopeful, like now nah, things are gonna work out. Like the universe will give us what we're so, Yeah, but sometimes it hurts a little bit in your budget. So being a little bit more <laughs> uh, conservative uh, really helped like in, in a, a project that we just done. So, and after this, uh, the course, I've, I've, I've been working here in my land, um, and, and also some clients are starting to appear. So clients in the north part, which is the desert, in the central part, which is Mediterranean, in the southern part, which is uh, so super humid and super uh, wet. So it, it, like the principles is, is, is what matters here. There's no recipes. So understanding those principles uh, as deep as possible for me has been uh, super good. So yeah, thanks for that. and. Uh, as Garrett said, I don't know where the train will take me, but I'm open for it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, you guys have touched on something, each of you, that um, one of the ways that I learned so much about water was working all over the world. And in these live office hour sessions, we get to popcorn all over the world and hear about, okay, here's what water situations are dealing with in northern chile or central chile and you know here's a totally different situation going on in austria and it's a nice way for people to be able to gain a lot about different situations over a really rapid period of time because instead of actually physically going to each of these places we're popcorning around in the office hours through the questions that get asked uh giselle would you like to go next yes hello everyone um, my name is Giselle Yanten. Um, I live in Cajon del Maipo, Chile, which is um, the upper section of the uh, basin of uh, Maipo River. And um, I come from the world of contemporary art. And um, I consider myself now more than anything an apprentice of regenerative practices. Um, I'm a land steward. Um, I've been regenerating a plot of land that used to be part of a sand mining site on the banks of the Maipo River. And um, I started that about um, three years ago. Um, the whole thing kind of started, I was meant to just have like a vegetable patch and it kind of escalated to a food forest and to something um, on a larger scale. 
um, I first joined the Water Stories community because at the beginning of the year, um, one of my goals was to take action for the river. I live in a context where um, water security is constantly threatened by um, mining projects, hydroelectric power plants, and I, I reached my personal limit. I had enough. I was like, if there's something I can do myself, I will do it, and I want, I want to find solutions. So that was my first um, goal and desire. And after watching some of the films that you have made, um, I joined the community, and then I found out about the course, um, which I thought was a good opportunity for me to learn more and to kind of, as a land steward, um, be exposed to information that I felt I didn't have. Um, so to me, it was just about really um, learning whatever I could to manage um, my land better. Um, my main concern as a land steward in the context that I'm in was that um, I, I get groundwater and I'm kind of privileged in that sense because people here in certain towns experience water scarcity, even though we're all right next to the river, but since there's a lot of intervention by, by the uh, power plants and all of that, uh, we're in a bit of a tight spot. So I really wanted to make sure um, that I was being responsible with the use of the water that I have. Um, so in that sense, um, what I've learned through the course um, has definitely given me um, so much more confidence in knowing what I'm doing and feeling um, that I that there are ways of actually managing your land and your water in ways that are regenerative, uh, that are responsible. Um, so that's that's one takeaway. Um, also, I think. Um, I feel like I, I've, I've gained a renewed point of view, like a wider perspective of the impact of my actions or of the place, even um, understanding the, the importance of what I do in my own land within a larger context. Um, that's something that is very evident for me right now. Um, and also uh, the course provides a lot of uh, tools, practical tools, like I now I'm aware that I know how to do many things that I had no idea that I could uh, do at the beginning of the year, um, whether that is practical work on my land or um, even tools for advocacy work. I'm part of a group of volunteers. Um, it's a citizen science initiative. We're measuring what we call the river's vitals. And yeah, I think there's there's great and potential to connect the more educational material that we've been provided and to give really good talks um, for the community. So that's that's also been really um, great. Um, and also, like everyone has said, um, for me, it's been really gratifying uh, being able to connect with you all um, at a local level. We formed a little group with the people from Central Chile We've been meeting, collaborating with each other, um, participating in each other's projects. So that's been great. And um, also connecting with people here um, within my own community, finding out that people do have an interest in water and, and in protecting the landscape. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's more or less it. Um, well, also, since I've been so much more vocal about the work that I'm doing, um, I got an opportunity to uh, participate in an exhibition as a, the co-author of uh, an artist book. Um, it's um, a project that kind of connects um, symbiotic relationships within a forest and the, um, the role of humans in nature. So um, I'll be taking part in that and it's, it's very exciting as well to kind of bring that into more of a cultural um, product, let's say, or outcome. Awesome. Thank awesome. you, Giselle. That was fantastic.
Um, real quick, Gerhard sent me a really fun pond picture, so I'm going to share it, and he can like show us a bit of context about, you know, how we built the pond and and a little bit about this project. So Gerhard, I'd love to hear about about this. This, this looks really cool. Yeah, uh, just to add, uh, the pond context is pretty easy. It's a uh, it's a it's a pond collecting uh, roof water from a big, huge garage. Uh, I thought it's gonna fill within, let's say, half a year. So I did it super huge, and when it was finished, I was there. I was like, "Fuck! It's too big. It's never gonna <laughs> fill." And yeah, this is the day after finishing. We had a uh, quite hard rain. And yeah, you can see how happy a father becomes when his pond starts filling, his son starts swimming, <laughs> and everything is ready to be planted. <laughs> so this is this is this picture. Uh, yeah, just to add, it uh, it filled within the first week, <laughs> so it's actually too small. <laughs> yeah, I'm living with it. <laughs> That's great. I can definitely. Okay, I can see the the look of pride on your face. Like this is my pond. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually, cool. this is it. <laughs> that's excellent. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. And Gerhard, you touched at the beginning on something that's so important: is just being open to failure. When we do nothing, nothing happens, and we need to make some steps, even if they're the wrong steps, in order to really learn, in order to really move forward. You know, was it, did the course give you confidence to proceed and go with these failures? Or how did you, how did you get over the hump to feel ready to act? Uh, hmm. So uh, actually the course, uh confronted me with failures <laughs> i mean you know like the best that you are not too much of a friend of uh, swales in every context and this is the first thing that i did actually so um i was like okay uh, yeah, i have to rethink the whole thing that i was thinking about for half a year and because actually when it continued i got this feeling okay no i'm not on the completely wrong path i just have to consider this and that and and unfortunately, I had to. I had already booked the the, the, the company bringing in the, uh, the the excavator, because one month later, I think I would have had a way better idea how to do it. <laughs> and this is whenever I'm there, I'm, I'm looking there and I think, yeah, yeah, I'm happy. I, I will do more of them because this is not the end of my my my. I don't know my. What I want to do it's 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 just the beginning. Like when we met last time uh, in this course in Italy, I, I said it already. It's like I think I will do this uh, project now. I will collect money. I will do more of it, and in the end, I will have this possibility to show people around, showing them all the things where I failed. <laughs> Don't do it like this. Do it a bit different. <laughs> and, and yeah. They, I think for normal people it looks it looks pretty awesome. So that that's the feedback that I get. And um, but for nerdy people, I can really recommend go into it, start doing it, and and get your colleagues in this network commenting on it. <laughs> so you will be cheered a lot, and you will also get a lot of ideas how to improve the thing. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I I think it looks awesome. I mean, I think you've done an incredible job there, especially for your first big project like that. And, you know, I think it's like playing an instrument. We don't pick up an instrument and learn the chords and then we're as good as we're ever going to be at it. It's something that we're constantly improving. It's really got a high degree of artistry with it. Um, so something that we're constantly improving upon and keeping that beginner's mentality, I think it's hugely important. I know I'm always finding things that I can do better. And, uh, you know, that's even after a decade of doing it as my 24 seven day job. Cool. So next we have, uh, Tomas is sharing a, a bit about, he, he created a pond. So Tomas, I'd love to hear a bit more about this. Okay, yeah, so um, here uh, we can see the, the pond that I, I did uh, at the beginning. Yes, 
So that's one of the things I did before the course begins. <laughs> Most of the mistakes uh, were there. So it, it was super interesting to see where did I uh, committed all of this uh, learning steps, uh, as I call them. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was super interesting to see that it, even though I had no faith at all that it would feel like it, where, where I live, it doesn't rain more than this year. It rained like 180 millimeters. And that was a lot. Like we were out in the rain, like shouting, it's raining. <laughs> uh, so so the you can see the road in the, in the right side of the land. That uh, used to be like a, a pain in the ass because it's dust from uh, August to April, that's pure dust that gets into the whole land and everything is dusty and the noise or whatever. So now it really turned into a huge source of water and it's amazing the amount of uh, water that we were able to collect. That This picture is from uh, like August, September, now which in December, it like uh, the one week ago, it finished uh, drying up. So it, it, it really turned into a <clears throat> kind of a seasonal water body. Uh, but, but one thing that I learned and, and it was amazing here it, it was a sediment trust. So if you, if you wanna avoid the, the pond to be filled with sediment, you have to make some kind of traps. And those traps turned into like a huge um, material harvest system. So there was, pure clay in some parts or pure sand in other parts. And that was something that really shocked me um, for, for the, the, the process or, or the maintenance of the, the water body. So what, you, what you're seeing here, like the big picture, the pond is in a, kind of the lowest part of, of this upper side. It used to be like a monoculture of eucalyptus. So there was a lot of terrace uh, buildings in the process and in the lowest part with the, this pond. The upper part, there are three other small ponds that were part of the glass. We, we can't see it like properly now. In the top corners, there are other two ponds that were also uh, part of the process. But you, you can't see the water uh, right now, just where the arrow is right now, there's one that filled quite fast as well. And in the other corner, the left corner of the land over there, there was like a long contour pond, like a uh, not swale contour pond. <laughs> Part of the learnings, <laughs> but yeah, and I don't know it, it. It also gave me a lot of like faith of what could be done in this place where the desert is almost here. So. Like to 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 being able to implement these techniques and knowledge and see like wow things really could change like um, even though it it really it, it doesn't rain that much it, it gives me a lot of hope I would have to be moving out of my place <laughs> yeah that's excellent thanks Tomas and real quick just for um a bit of background about how these are filled so for the the pond down here did the water drain from the road is that where it came from yeah it, it has uh, two feeders from the road uh, okay cool yeah, as of now Sounds so yeah and, and there's videos. like a yeah that's exactly how it goes and in those two arrows you have like those sediment traps and all the system outboards very cool how, how big is this area how many hectares no, that's half. Uh, what you're seeing right now is half an hectare. Wow. Yeah. That's great. I've done a lot of things in half an hectare. <laughs> yeah. Well, it looks beautiful, man. This looks so amazing. Thank you yeah. for sharing it. And if you think, I mean, that's as, that's as dry as you can get, really. I mean, there are drier places, but not many in the world. And just incredible that even there, you have this at times water running away, running downstream, leaving the property. And you're doing such an incredible thing for this landscape by just getting that water to stay on site where it can benefit the vegetation, benefit the groundwater. A really amazing example of even in, you know, a pretty dry, harsh landscape and a small size, you can really still do a tremendous amount. Working on it. Well, good on you. This looks amazing. Thanks, Thomas. 
Thank you. Nick, I see we, I see uh, you're getting darker there as your solar is fading, <laughs> and I want to make sure you can chime in again before we lose you. I know you've had some really interesting and promising successes, um, you know, for one, doing this work and starting to get your hands dirty, but even more so starting to outreach some really big groups. Uh, you know, you have a really good way about you with outreach of this kind of stuff on social media, but also in conferences with you know, some major players involved. I wonder if you could tell us some more about your work in that regard. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, yeah, it's not, uh, the solar system is not dying. I'm just trying to not put on any lights so the batteries last a bit longer. Um, yeah, I figured. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no, we've, we've, with Climate Farmers, every year we, we've organized a big conference uh, for the European regenerative agriculture scene. But also I'm doing a lot of work um on social media just kind of spreading the word about water and it's it's really nice what what i'm seeing especially over the last year is that the interest is shifting and people are realizing that water is actually important and you can't really take it for granted and yeah it's, it's really interesting so we're getting we're getting interest from from different organizations so larger organizations that are realizing they want to put their money to work for something that's better than just any random charity and just basically putting money away to, to feel good. And what I think is the most important thing with water is with all these other focuses that you that you could have. Um, and I mean, especially with climate farmers, we're working a lot with carbon and, and it's super important for agriculture. But still, if you do everything right, it will take so long until you see any results. And with water, like if you do good work, it takes one rainy season, sometimes even just one strong rain event and you can see the, the effects. And I think that's that's what we're seeing a lot. So at the conference, there was a lot of interest from um, not just from farmers, but also from from industry on a policy level. People are also realizing that if you have droughts, if you have floods with better water management and water cycle restoration, you can kind of buffer both. Um, you can restore your landscape. So I think what people are realizing now is that if you get your water right, all these other things just happen kind of for free automatically on the back end of that. And um, yeah, it's, it's incredible to see that people are realizing it, people want it. And now the, the biggest bottleneck that I'm seeing is people who can then make it happen. So that's why this course is so important. It, it seems like everywhere people want it. And, and especially for our work at Climate Farmers, we want to connect farmers with people who can help them with water management, but they're booked out at least half a year in advance. Uh, the prices are skyrocketing because there's so much demand. So, yeah, uh, if, if there's anything that's a future-proof job, it's definitely working with water. Absolutely. And I see it more year after year. I mean, just more and more projects coming in, and it's driving me mad, which is a big part of creating the course, so that there are lots of people around the world doing this kind of work. And, um, you know, it's I think you said it perfectly. If you want a future-proof job, it's – it's good to be in the business of creating water right now because everyone needs it, whether it's a big hotel on the beach or a small farmer in the mountains, they're all having to start dealing with the water realities that are coming. Right. Uh, Giselle, you've said a couple of things that have really stuck with me um, <clears throat> during some of the office hours that I wonder if you could just um, kind of expound upon for the people joining us here. Uh, one is that you felt like the course has really become like a type of home for you, um, which I really love. I mean, I know that I feel that way as well. It really creates this amazing community of people. Um, but then you also shared yesterday about how, and I find this to be so true when you, when you have a clear, hopeful message that you feel confident in delivering, people seem to just want to draw it out of you where you don't even really need to push the conversation in that direction. It just seems to come up and people seem to be interested. And yeah, I wonder if you could just uh, share a little bit more on those. Well, yeah, what has happened to me is that um, I think probably one of the things that I find so um, wonderful and that I really love about um, the way that you are presenting the message through the course is that um, it's very, we're joining a party, 
it's not uh, we're not just like oh crying and trying to find solutions because we're going to die it's it's really about um feeling empowered and taking responsibility i love that part as well um i find it so necessary for us to be able to um you know um take a look at what we have done as humans and um, and just uh take responsibility and enjoy our creative capacity as well to create something that's um beautiful and uh and better for everyone and everything. Um, so for me, it's been really um, the fact that I have um, so much more information than I did before about water, how things work, and um, and about things that could be done uh, has made it really easy to connect with other people because you know water is everywhere. <laughs> we need it. It sometimes feels like. Um, you might be pushing the conversation, but for me, it hasn't. That hasn't happened. Like um, I mentioned before, I'm I one time catching up with friends. Um, we ended up talking about water because I mentioned how um, I don't know. I stopped painting years ago because uh, it was polluting water and finding ways of not doing that, and how your actions actually impact. Uh, um, waterways and the ocean and aquifers. So that's one way of connecting with artists, um, for instance. Um, or I don't know, I had a chat with uh, someone, the owner of a bakery. Just because we live here, we kind of tend to pay attention to what's going on um, in the mountains. So I started talking about snow, how snow was melting, and we ended up you know, talking about the water cycle and then um, getting offered uh, to give a talk for the community because this person organized events, uh, film festivals and events for the community. So I'm, to me, it's just been really um, more of an, an effortless thing, like an everyday life type of conversation um, where um, if you really have some examples to provide um people really um are really interested like Riven rivers the film is a huge one here because since we are in a context of drought and um and we're um the the presence of the river is huge here especially in santiago because the maipo river is the main source of potable water anything that speaks to making a river better it's just people are like is that even possible i had no idea you could do that i had no idea you could restore the water cycle in that way so people are super super excited about those examples um, so it's great to have them that's awesome thanks to gel um real quick so zach i feel like we're gonna why don't we hop in the questions soon but before we do for those who aren't acquainted why don't we uh share a bit about the course let me share yeah, that, that sounds great. Okay. I was going to ask Julia one more question. Um, yeah. Maria, go in, yeah, go into the course now and then ask Julia a question and then we'll go into the audience questions. Cool. Well, guys, for those who are uh, aren't acquainted, you know, like Water Stories has launched a core course. Everybody who you saw speaking here has gone through the core course through way different pathways, whether they're farmers and landowners themselves, whether they've been helping people do this as a profession and you saw it whether they're advocates too, helping the community like build water retention features where they are and learning how showing their community how to do this you know uh, i think we've put two years into this showing people different pathways for how they can restore the water cycle where they are for their professionals land stewards, land stewards or advocates and it's opened up again um it's a it's a live course that goes for six months you have live questions and answers with Zach. And uh, enrollment for those interested, it ends on Saturday night. So if you want to get on this, eventually we are going to launch a, like basically a, a pace yourself version of the course. But what we have now is actually, you get one-on-one -on -one time with Zach to, to basically get coaching in this community where you can learn from each other as you go, because that's going to be super helpful as you're doing these, these challenges and these assignments that are going to help you grow. Uh, that course, it's open now and Saturday, and the price is, is $2,900 or 
48.5 per month. So uh, that's in the chat box below. Uh, just look for the link from me and uh, we'll send the replay of this webinar afterwards with that link. So we hope you can join and, and start your own water cycle restoration journey because you're, you're gonna be part of a really amazing group of people. Like all of the, I, I'm so inspired hearing all your stories because that's so cool to think this, this thing that kind of created from nothing led to people creating ponds. That's what we wanted to do. That's exactly the function of this. People were storing their water cycle and kind of creating like a network of people showing others how to do the same. Yeah, awesome. And just to add a little more detail there. So we will be uh, this January opening a content only version, um, but that is just the video modules. So none of the live question and answer sessions, no workbook, no certification. Uh, so this offering that's closing now is for the full course, the course that everyone on this call ran through. Um, and then that offering that will open in January is essentially a self-paced, no course group. So for people that just want to watch the videos, that's a good way to go. But I think that the real value of the course is a lot in the community that you become part of in these live sessions, the question and answers in these live sessions, all of the bonus video content uh, that's released as part of that. Um, so the uh, offerings might look a little similar, but there's actually a, a lot of difference between the two. And that's the full course being the full package. That's what's closing at the end of the day on Saturday. And then the content only version uh, is basically a trimmed down version that's, uh, you know, a one off, do it at your own pace on your own time um, without a group. Um, yeah, so it, it, people in the audience, uh, get your questions ready, feel free to drop them in the question and answer or uh, use the raise hand feature. We'll call on you to ask them with your voice. Um, but before we get to that, uh, Julia, I know you've had a lot of success in your area. You know, I wonder if you can speak to how some of the actions in the course require you to do things that then put you out there in your community as a water leader. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of actions. Um, there's a lot of, um, Options that provide opportunities to talk to people if um, you're so inclined. Um, the big one for me was the uh, presentation. Is it 8.3 or 8.4 something that um, I think it's called community outreach, maybe specifically. Um, and that's the one I got really excited about. I saw it coming way down the line and I was like rushing through assignments to get to it. And um, I, I kind of just took that opportunity and ran with it. I know like some people are doing um, a presentation to their family and like their living room and all of, but I just was like, no, this is an opportunity and I'm gonna go with it. And there just happened to be this cute little like historical schoolhouse around the corner. And I'm like, what a great place to do the presentation. And so I just kind of put some things together. Um, and that's really what started all of this for me was just that, that one little decision to take it outside of my comfort zone. Um, yeah, yeah, that was the main one. And now you're you're continuing to do recurring presentations with them, as I understood it, or the offer to and tied in with the fire yeah. department. Could you expand a bit on that? Sure. Yeah, so the schoolhouse is run by um, a board and the board members got, they saw the presentation the first time. They were very hesitant. It took me a long time to put it together because they really didn't know what I was asking for for a long time. And it took me a while to explain it. Um, but we got it on the books. We finally got it done. And they were very excited about the, uh, the material. One of the board members actually has 40 acres that she's turning into a food forest. She has Yugal culture. So she's already kind of in this vein, um, which is doing what she can on her own property. And um, so they asked me to make it a monthly thing. They're like, you know, can you come back every month? We can build this up. Eventually we want to add other speakers and develop this whole community sort of project. Um, but one of the things I did was I, I'm not on social media, so I had to find another way to advertise. And so I printed flyers and I took them around my local community and I put them on community boards and I talked to people. 
And so I went to the fire department to let them know what I was doing. And the deputy fire marshal called me and he was a little worried about the information, not knowing what it was going to be. Um, but I kind of explained to her, I said, you know, my focus is on water and my focus is before you guys like stopping the fire from even being on the property in the first place. And she got really into the information. She connected me to some other people. One of those people is working with uh, grants, providing grants for landowners um, for fire prevention. And so now I'm working with him on grants where I'm hoping to have some effect with policy change um, as far as like the grant requirements or some of them have a lot of wiggle room, but some of them should be worded better and there's a little anyway. So yeah, it's all kind of just from that one first presentation and, and going out into the community and just having um, sort of, I don't want to say being forced to talk to people, but taking the opportunity to force myself to talk to people um, really just blew everything open for me. Awesome. That's so great to hear. And what just what a simple step forward, but you know, that's going to create ripple effects for such a long period of time throughout the community. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> um, Raleigh, I think should we start opening up to audience questions? If yeah, let's do it. To... Looks like we got some good ones. Um, I think the first yeah. person who asked the question is Carol. Carol is saying how much time is required for the course per week? You guys can probably answer that better than me. I know I have what I say, but I haven't actually taken it on the student side. What What do you guys think? Well, I would say it takes uh, it depends very much on uh, how you go into it. <laughs> you can probably do it with, yeah, one hour watching video, making the tasks. We go maybe two, three, four hours a week and then yeah then it's up to you <laughs> but I, I would at least uh, take five hours a week to to really get the process done and to fulfill all the tasks for certification can even take longer yeah yeah also in the I beginning i oh. oh sorry do you want to no, go sorry, first it's all. you're fine okay. no you can go first um no and at the beginning i didn't consider um uh, office hours so i would say yeah add, add, add to the the hour or two hours that it will take to uh, watch the content and then if you want to join office hours maybe two or three hours more um and then the work that uh, how long it, it will take i don't know that depends on how long you take which i, I would say like um, gerhard said i would say between at least five hours per week yeah And I was just going to add, um, it's, it's also kind of very flexible. Um, I feel like I could have rushed pretty quickly through the content in line with the release date. Um, probably, yeah, like five, maybe 10 hours a week. I could have gotten it done, but there's, there's a lot of wiggle room with the assignment. You know, you can do them fast and dirty and get them out and just get the content so you can start doing the practice and doing the work that you want to do or um, you can use the assignment to actually do the work itself as well. So it can take a little bit longer. Um, and I ended up quitting my time job so I could do the course. So yeah, it, I think you could do it fast. But, um, but if you really want to uh, get deep into it, I mean, I was spending 20, 25 hours a week on it easy. Nice. I think that's a pretty solid answer. It's like, especially when it comes to some of the assignments. I know, you know, some of these assignments are big, like giving a presentation to a community, you know, renting some equipment and and trying to do some water ret retention work. It, it could take you a few months. It could be pretty quick, depending on where your experience level is. But it's it's great hearing where people are coming from and from way different backgrounds, way different levels of, of time, but still being able to get through the course. Great, so um, there's some questions. Uh, Jeff is asking a little bit, how can you tell us a little bit about how office hours work? Zach, why don't you give us a little, little bit of info about that? Yeah, um, well, so the office hours are essentially, they're module focused as we're releasing each of the module, um, each of the modules, and then, 
Uh, later in the course, they move to um, professional development sessions, which happen monthly and a continuing basis for alumni as well, um, and then special topics as well. Um, so with this next round of the course, we're, we're stretching out the timeline because a lot of people, people felt really pressed to have everything within three months. Uh, so we've expanded it to six months, which seems like what more people would have been happy with. Um, so the, the office hours will be mostly module focused, but they're basically open time for question and answer. Um, we are going to also with this next round, try and have people mostly ask their questions beforehand so that we can break up the videos, make them a little bit more searchable because it's a little untenable to have a, a two, three hour video to scan through for questions. Um, but with the way that this last round ran, it was basically everyone bring your questions uh, and we dive into each question as, as deep as we can go to make sense of it. Um, I wonder too, if you guys have anything to add as far as office hours or uh, what people should expect there. Yeah, I would really love to get them sorted by topics. Yeah, the ones that we have. <laughs> Just to <laughs> there is so much content in a, and I'm constantly looking. Where was it? <laughs> it's so difficult to find. Yeah, it's a good it's a good improvement to do it. And I don't know what I like more about the office hours. It's uh, is it the, the fact that you can put your question? Is it the fact that you see the people? Is it the fact that you get the progress from the others? There is a lot in it. It's uh, I can only recommend to do it. I mean, I sometimes have to work besides do it, uh, besides listening to it. But I really recommend to be there with full attention. It's it's really worth it. Uh, all of the others know my little son. He was sitting on my lap for two hours sometimes, just watching the video, although he understands nothing, just because it was so delighted for me and I guess also what he saw that he just liked it it was just sitting and watching and what was happening so you could take it as a meditation maybe even <laughs> that's good to hear our editing time interested children that's awesome um oh, so Brian well Brian's asking I have some experience in the case study I'd like to share that's awesome maybe after we ask a few more questions we can come back to you Brian um uh Carol is Carol's asking. Also, would you mind explaining the certification and accreditation from doing the course? Yeah, so the certification is through Water Stories. Um, so as people successfully complete the course, uh, they receive the uh, matching certification. Um, this is not a uh, an achievement award. We really want our certification to mean something. And so as all of the people on the call know, you know, it's a lot of things that you have to do in order to actually get the certification. And that's because when we list someone on the website as a Water Stories certified advocate, steward, or professional, we want to know that that person, not only can they do it, they are already doing it. Um, so that's one of the really important distinctions about our certification. So there's no university accreditation um, that enables us to speak more freely about topics and not be beholden to certain funders. Um, and it is essentially a, a certification that you are ready to engage with others in the capacity that you've trained to throughout the course. Nice. That's good. And actually, it's in the next question by Rachel. Rachel's asking about, is there any in-person opportunities even during the course or after to, to work on projects together or dive further into learning, like things like workshops and, and training? You know, that, that's something that we're really stoked about setting up. But Zach can explain a little bit more about, you know, the vision for what we're going to do in 2023. Yeah, so this is something we've been gearing up towards for a while. Um, we did one in-person event in Italy just this past month. Uh, Gerhard was present there um, and a lot of other students from the course. Um, about half the people at the workshop were students from the course. Um, what we will do in 2023 is our in-person uh, workshops. The course will be a prerequisite for those in-person workshops. So essentially, 
This workshop in Italy was put on by an environmental foundation. It was part students of the course, part local Italians. Um, it made it so that we couldn't go as fast because not everyone had the understanding of the course. Uh, and so with our all of our in-person opportunities in 2023, uh, we will have one in the US for sure. Uh, we will hopefully have one in Europe. Um, and then I would love to have one in South America as well somewhere. Um, yeah, let's make it happen. Um, so the, the goal is essentially that this core course is kind of the 101. Let's get all the nuts and bolts. Let's do everything we can from afar. Let's cover all that stuff so that when we get together in person, we can dive in deep. We can get right into detail about doing the project. We can get people in the machines. We can be feeling the clay and saying, this is too wet. This is too dry. This is too little. This is too much. Uh, so that we can basically skip all the classroom time. We would still have classroom time for questions and things like that, but we can basically get right into action and go really far and fast in these future in-person opportunities. Nice. So Jeff is asking, once you get certification in our list on the website, is there follow-up support as you gain knowledge and expertise doing projects professionally? Yes, yeah, so most of this falls within the alumni tier. Um, so once you complete the course, you can continue your membership for a 90% discount through the alumni tier. And then you continue to have access to the monthly professional development sessions. So essentially every month we get together and talk about the projects that people have going on. And so that's a great opportunity to do that. Um, and then also during the course, and then if you continue at that alumni rate, you can also get one-on-one -on -one coaching with me um, at an additional fee, but much cheaper than my usual fees are. Um, and then we are looking, at, this will be more on a, a one-off basis, um, but I am trying to set up situations where we can also have students shadow a consultation, for example, um, or shadow a project so that there are more hands-on learning opportunities. Uh, and then there's also a developing program. I've kind of jokingly been calling it the rent -a zach program, um, but where essentially people can get enough projects in an area that they have a client who's gonna cover my fees, but actually the student would be the one bringing me in. They bring me in for a certain period of time and we focus on whatever that person as the student wants to, whether it's giving presentations and bringing a lot of projects in, implementing some projects, doing some workshops, training up local operators, whatever is going to help that person best get established where they are. Cool. So uh, quick, I guess this is a quick question from Toby. Are the times of live meetings already determined? It seems like it's an important part of the course. I may make sure that I can make the times. So people in different time zones, how, how are you guys like making it to the meetings or using the meetings? Um, so we have the, the uh, two different time slots, essentially, um, a Monday evening time slot and a Tuesday morning time slot in American time zones. So usually the Monday evening is uh, people who want it in the evening uh, in the Americas and then also uh, Australia, Asia, India, those countries. Um, and then our Tuesday morning time frame is typically America and Europe time zones um, in Africa as well. Uh, so what we do is we pull the group at the beginning to dial in those time slots as far as when exactly the most people are available and what times are the most convenient. Um, what we did for this last round based on the polling that we got was um, what was it? It was uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time, Monday evening, and 9 a.m. Pacific time, Tuesday morning. Uh, and that seemed to hit times where there was kind of two distinct groups with some people who would be able to hop between, um, but that seemed to hit everybody, uh, even though we had people in India, Australia, New Zealand, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. Cool. 
So I see two questions would be good to go through and then we can open it up to another like live question or we could close out the webinar. Um, Jan is asking, I have no land, so no water project. Would it be better to wait until I have both? Uh, so the advocate pathway opens up the opportunity to do the course without any land access. Um, and you can also complete a certain pathway and then continue as alumni and upgrade your certification level over time. Um, so even if you want to be a professional, but you want to start the course right away, you can complete the advocate level without any land access. Uh, but you do need some land access for both the steward and professional levels. Um, I don't know, if, what do you guys think as students in that kind of situation? Would it be better to wait or do it? What would your feeling be? Um, I would say that it, if you have something or some place to do it, whether it's yours or from another uh, uh, owner, go for it. But uh, like in my experience, a friend of mine that didn't have like uh, a already set on her mind like where to do it, she's still searching for a place to do it. So it it might be like it, it really depends on if you have uh, a place to try things and you don't need like big spaces for that. Like most of the tests, you can do them in small spaces. But if you don't have like nothing at all like start searching from now, like if there's a friend of yours or a neighbor that would like to try some stuff, like start those conversations from day one, I would say. But don't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna agree, yeah, don't wait. And um, and I actually found a little bit the opposite of, of what you were saying, Claude, where um, I did start with land, but I found there were, there kept being, opportunities that popped up that I wasn't expecting along the way. Um, and uh, certainly, if you don't mind donating your services for experience in the beginning, um, you know, you can start the course as an advocate and just don't be surprised if you get opportunities to work on actual land as you go. You like you work kind of when those opportunities are for you to find as well. That's a great answer. So I guess, uh, Brian, see, Brian Kervlitz, sorry if I'm saying your name, slaughtering your last name, but he says he has a case, he's a student who has a case study that he wants to share. We have one more question we want to answer, and then we can get to, uh, I'll promote Brian to a panelist so he can share his story. But um, Ryan's asking, Zach, have you personally been referring clients to any of your participants from your first water stories course? The course explains that select number of people will be on your website as practitioners. Can you speak or today speak to this pathway as a professional career? Um, we haven't started yet, but we will be soon. Um, we have people who have reached certification and um, we're really bringing this uh, all to bookends at the end of this month as well to um, get everybody caught up, get everybody certified. And at that point, we will have everyone listed on the website. Uh, we have been shouting everybody out in the newsletter as we go with different certifications as people are ready as well. Um, not everyone wants to be shouted out immediately, um, but that is something we're definitely gearing up towards. Um, it's now I should also specify, I don't, I think this is going. So there is also a practitioner certification, um, which is another level of certification on top of the three existing levels for the course. Uh, and that is, you know, kind of a, not a lifetime achievement, but that's a, a longer route. I don't expect anyone to complete that within the six months of the course, um, but more so within the six months of the course, achieving one of the certification levels. And then as they've been doing it for a year or a couple of years and shown that they really can perform in a variety of different situations, um, that's the point at which we award practitioner certification. Uh, so there's no clear timeline for that. There's no clear pathway for that um, other than just doing the course and continuing to do good work. Because um, the, the one level is essentially saying this person is ready to do this work. Um, the other level is saying 
this person can do the work in all regards uh, and they're ready to go full speed ahead. Um, so I, I'd say one certification level is this person's ready to get started and offer professional services. The other is this person's ready to take on a million dollar water project and direct the whole thing. Um, so that's why we have those two different levels. Yeah, and like like Apollo is doing independent spring casing work. No, he. Yep, and we have been referring. Yeah, we have been referring projects um, that fit a person's skills already. Certainly, uh, so the the practitioners level is really you can do everything. You can tap springs. You can build water bodies. You can do. You can manage big projects. Um, but what we have been referring to is people who are ready and skilled in certain areas and ready to offer those services in lieu of ourselves to clients. Um, and that we certainly have started to do as well. Cool. Well, I know there, there's many other questions, but unfortunately we probably don't have time for all of them. Uh, but we will have another Q&A session that you can join on Saturday if there's burning questions that you, know, you have, didn't get answered, there'll be another opportunity for that. Now, Brian said he went through the course and he has a little story of his own to share. So Brian, I would love to hear more, uh, more about your journey. It's, it's awesome hearing you just pop in and say like, hey, I went through the course, I have something to share. I would, yeah, sorry. I would, we'd love to hear it. Sorry, I joined a little bit late. I was out doing chores. Um, anyway, yeah, I just can't speak highly enough of uh, Zach's ability to just be there with you, the, the, um, you know, the, the meeting times and stuff are so valuable in addition to all the coursework and stuff that's there, the, um, the modules. Um, you know, I had been doing some of this work um, years prior. And then when I saw Zach was offering this course, um, I, I just like, okay, I got to do this and just get on board. Uh, sometimes even hearing things from a different perspective and from different ways, it just reaffirms things that you know. And, um, and then you always learn all kinds of new things. So it's been super valuable to go through the course. I'm not 100% complete yet, but I'm almost there. Um, and we have done a number of projects, and I don't know, uh, I could just walk you through a, a quick one we did last year, um, if we have time. And uh, Yeah, yes, please. I've, sure, I've been, sure. the last two, last two years, I've, I've kind of done this model, at least for clients that are interested in it, is running a model of an installation that's also a course. So... I, um, you know, students sign up, their, their fee kind of helps offset the client's uh, expenses to get the installation of the project done. Um, and so I'll, I'll just give you some quick, I've pulled up some videos and a, a thing. If I share my screen, I'll show you. Um, let's see. Okay, go for it. I'll just share my whole... Um, uh, desktop. It's a little cluttered, but um, we'll get going here. Um, so this is the overall project. Um, it is kind of a weird shape area, but uh, we ended up putting in this upper pond and this connection and these two uh, swale connection systems. We didn't do this pond but we did this connection to also um, join with this existing pond. And I will then show some, here's an overview of the property. So this is a neighbor's pond here. And then this is their existing pond that actually has beavers in it here. And um, Brian, real quick, what might help is uh, if you click full screen in that preview box. Oh, okay. Or you click share okay. screen yeah, and then just um, share that. Where's the full screen? It just should be in the left side, like a big green plus button. Um, if you're on a, I think you're on a Mac, so. Yeah, I am. Uh, so it says three little dot, three little dots on on the left oh, okay. side. Uh, full screen. If you grow a view, full screen there. 
three dots. I, is it in the 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 preview app or is yeah it yeah you're previewing in the uh, those images right now and there's three little dots on the side. Um, uh, the upper left hand corner. Upper left there. hand, yeah, and one green one should allow you to full screen it. Uh, a little bit higher up. Yeah. Uh, the three gray just above where you were. Yeah. Yep. Oh, there. Uh, there. Doink. There we go. Boom. Okay, and can I go? Yeah, okay. you can zoom yeah. in a little bit. So um, this is just kind of an aerial overview, but this is the pond that we installed. Um, we ended up having too small of a piece of equipment. So my solution was leave an island in the middle. <laughs> you know, if you get out of the reach. So here's our spillway. Um, let's see, how come it's not continuing on through, oh, there. So here's like, this is one week after the installation. It rained the cover, or maybe a week and a half. We got a cover crop in, our trees, um there's the pond some of the lower systems the spillway here's the crew and um you know here we are installing our plantings and you know the beauty of this kind of model is that people have an opportunity to see a real life experience get their hands on the equipment and actually get the project done this is um, part of the course work where we're making models in the ground. And this is all covered in Zach's course modules of like learning to read soils, learning how to do models that really mimic the landscapes and understanding how water works through the system. Um, and these are super valuable skills uh, and it, it just walks through the whole system. Um, Anyway, this, this is just a quick little um, thing. And it just going through the course gave me confidence to be able to do this kind of stuff. And it builds community and um, outreach within the neighboring um, people. And uh, in these courses, I found a lot of people were landowners or were wanting to do this, but didn't have the confidence either. So they're able to take these skills directly home and start implementing some of it. So um, I just want to, you know, thank, thank Zach. Here, I, I have one more I want to share. This is, we, we dug, we did a test slice. It looked like high enough clay. But as we we're building up the dam, the um, water started coming in. And this is the dam wall. What are you guys standing on? Oh boy. <laughs> so we were getting we were getting liquefaction and stuff going on through just a little bit of water in, in that soil. And this was like one of these uh-oh moments and it was like, okay, how do we deal this? And, you know, so we just built up that back embankment a fair bit and, and let it settle, make sure we had, you know, all our spillways in place. And, and I told them not to install the, the stand pipe on the monk, just keep the water level low, let it settle. And it's all it's all resolved, but boy, have you experienced that, Zach? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, it's you end up having to do a lot of extra work. Um, <laughs> usually, kind of digging that back out, getting dry stuff. But it's when you're chasing water and fighting water, it can get a lot more challenging. Yeah, um, if the water's coming in faster than you can deal with it. Yeah, it wasn't coming in fast. It was just enough water to, you know, allow allow that sloshy material to move around. Mm. Yeah. Well, Brian, anyway, I, awesome. thank you so much for chiming in. That was really cool. I like that's beautiful, and especially activating your whole, you know, community, all the landowners, you know, to to show them to get how to do the same. Like that's really amazing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. inspiring work. 
Thanks. Well, you're inspiring. And, um, you know, I super encourage people to look at this and, and like what other people were saying, there's all different levels. You don't need to have land if you're a fan of water and, and want to work with how the water works with the landscape. There's all kinds of ways to, to get involved in that uh, within your community, uh, aside from, you know, operating equipment and whatnot. Um, and people are interested in it. It's like you just barely put the word out. And I like I've got four different invitations to go speak on these issues uh, without really, you know, doing any effort Just people find out about me. So that's wonderful. And Brian, real quick, where, where are you coming in from? We are uh, I'm in the Pacific Northwest, um, <laughs> nice. in, north of Bellingham, right up near the Canadian border. Nice. Yeah, yeah it's like definitely an idea that time has come. Um, I'm thinking if there's anybody who wants to uh, ask a question with their voice in the audience still, you could use the raise hand feature. Um, if there's a few of those, maybe we do a few fi uh, final questions. But otherwise, I'd love to hear just kind of closing thoughts from each of our panelists here. Um, closing thoughts about water, water stories, your own work, the course, whatever you'd like to share with the people on the call today. Uh, it seems like we're pretty much through all the big questions here. Um, there's some more uh, just topical questions, I think less about the course, but more about um, just kind of the techniques in general, uh, which I'd say Friday or Saturday session or final Q&A for the course would be a better spot for those. Um, so happy to answer those at, at that point. Um, Looks like Toby. Toby is. Oh, yeah, we've got a few. Gone. Yeah. So, um, also, too, well, yeah, how about we'll, we'll keep it to two and then we'll we'll close it out. I think that's a that's probably a good way to end it. Hey, Toby, how you doing? Hi, good. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me? Yep. Hear you great. OK, um, I just wanted to ask um, if you could give, give some examples for the kind of tasks or assignments that, you know, we typically do in the course. So I understand that that's an important part. Um, you know, to do the workbook beyond just watching the videos, but I don't really have a clear idea as to, you know, what kind of um, assignments or um, exercises or whatever they are. So it would be great to get some examples for that. Yeah, do you all want to share some of the ones that stuck out the most to you? Um, yeah, I can give it a shot. So it's it's on the one side, it's more like higher level so analyzing a bit of your watershed and and what's going on in in your area so this is more on the on the policy level um then it's also about concept designing so you come up with an idea of what you want to do uh, with the landscape and refining that but for me i think by far the most impactful were model building exercises where it's basically just like okay what what do you want to do in big and then building smaller versions of it um, and that was so insightful. I thought I had an idea of how to work with clay and then just tiny differences in the amount of water made such a big difference in building the, the key for the dam. And I'm so glad that I did that on a small spade level and not bulldozer level. That would have totally screwed me over. Um, yeah, so it's, it goes in, in very many levels. But model building, I think, is, uh, for me at least, that was the most impactful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you guys want to share some of the others? Any of the other? Yeah, I would say, you know, there's those hands on exercises are super valuable, but there's a lot of also like thought and short essays that are required to give thought about like your watershed, research your watershed, research policy, um, kind of look at your community and see what their needs are and and what the assets and what the deficits are kind of like evaluation kind of research that goes all along your water like how it's used and and then what what are your water resources so there's a, a lot of thought and research that goes into some of these um action uh responses 
and then and then also learning you know map making and reading the landscape and uh zach puts a lot of attention and effort and it's so valuable into reading the landscape and being attuned to nature and the way that it flows um, uh, encouraging sit spots of like places to sit and just observe and take in the information that nature has to offer it was super valuable to um, making the right decision over the long haul in the landscape that's fantastic so it's something that you, you know yeah you could set aside special time for that but it's also you can incorporate some of these things into your daily life and they become part of your your regular practice even you know through throughout the whole course all right well thank you toby thanks thanks brian thanks nick for answering thank that you. question how about we move it over to john and then that will be the final question of this session and just a reminder everyone's going to get the replay after this as long you know as well as the link to the course and you'll get um you'll get a link to the q a session for on saturday if you want to join that one so hey john uh you're enabled to speak if you want to ask a question here um so my question is um are the uh, the land steward, the pro, and the advocate uh, completely different curriculums, or do they basically kind of build on top of each other? Can you hear me? Um, yeah, I can answer that one pretty simply. So there, it's all the same exact content. Um, it is essentially different required actions for certification. Um, so. As far as the content that you're going to have access to, which pathway you choose makes no difference in terms of your course experience. As far as what you need to do to complete the course and achieve certification, that's where the pathway really comes in. Um, so basically, we give all of the information to all of the pathways, um, even things like how to do estimates and budgets. Those video modules are open to the advocate pathway, but the advocate pathway isn't required to put together a budget for a project before they complete the course, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Uh, and so, I mean, for me specifically, I'm kind of looking at this in a, uh, I recently had a, a change of life direction, getting more into the holistic management of land. Uh, and so, uh, my first level is kind of stewardship. I have a two acre family farm that I want to get into permaculture and water harvesting and all that good stuff. Um, on a professional level, uh, there's kind of a, uh, what a lot of your uh, students end up doing, the, the landscaping in a holistic manner kind of business. Um, and then there's actually a very interesting permaculture style subdivision that might be going in that I might be helping with. Uh, so that's the pro level, but then what I'm really kind of feeling my heart pulling towards is kind of some advocate stuff with, uh, I'm here in Northern Arizona, so we are in a very arid area, um, advocating with the Forest Service to get on contour swales and the like put into uh, some of our desert areas because I've seen the pictures from the 70s when my dad was walking around these same areas and it was I wouldn't say lush but it was definitely not as desertified as it is currently and I feel like that is something that requires some government action and if I can help advocate that if I can help bring the studies and get the government to do what they're supposed to do and protect the country protect the people that's uh that's something that would be near and dear to my heart so i kind of want to do all three and i guess if it's all the same content then i just have to do everything yeah thomas could speak to that <laughs> uh yeah uh, i would definitely recommend you to go into this because you you will have like the not only the information or, or the uh, the space to learn all you need to like achieve what you're talking about because it, it, it they do kind of uh, build up on each other um, 
and and yeah, like the, the deeper you go, the the more uh, intensity and and I don't know electricity comes and says like yeah, okay, you have to go this as well and go for that one as well, but, and then you you have this kind of uh, wake up call to say okay now get your shit together and do what you need to do like in the proper way and don't stop like scattering all your energy around <laughs> be strategic and 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 go for it but yeah definitely i would recommend it recommend you to go through it uh and and there's no better time than now like as Zach said before if you don't do nothing nothing happens it's, it's just as simple as that yeah, and so you can change pathways as many times as you like. You can pursue multiple pathways. Thomas has advocate and steward and is working on professional, for example. Um, so you you get all the information regardless of which pathway you choose. Um, it's really just which actions we require you to do uh, for a certification. And one good thing is like you never know where you start where you're going to end up. Be one of the other. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's exactly the same that I wanted to say. Don't go for the professional. Just start, and you will see how far it it, it drags you. And I went way more into it than I expected. <laughs> so, and I'm still not not even with the certification of a professional or anything. But I feel that it's gonna take me, yeah, some more time <laughs> of my life <laughs> to go into this path. So. Start small and the rest will come, as Thomas said. Sounds good. Awesome. Thanks, John. Well, everybody, I feel like that's a great place to end on for uh, for this webinar. Thank you guys all for joining and, and donating your time. Yeah, I, Bear, can Hi, we, Thomas, Brian, Nick. I, can Julie we get maybe well. some final thoughts from each of you guys oh, yeah, before yeah. we wrap it up? Anything you'd like to share really about about water stories, about your own work, about the course, or whatever you think might be relevant. Um, I think yeah. one, one thing that, oh, sorry, no, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. You went first. Ah, too kind, sorry. <laughs> Um, no, one thing that I also saw in the in the chat was a question about about the money monetary aspect. And it's definitely an investment, but um, what I'm seeing, like working with hundreds of farmers and, and landowners uh, across Europe, but also the world, there is so much demand for this. So like, I know this is, it's a lot of money, but um, yeah, there's just so much demand. And if, if we're looking at what's happening in the world right now, like if there's one thing that will be needed in the future, it's water cycle restoration. Um, yeah, so it might take a few projects to get the money back, but is like I have zero doubt that uh, that that investment will pay off uh, many many times uh, going forward. So yeah, I, I wouldn't get discouraged by it and just go for it. It's an awesome community and very needed. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, something that I've really enjoyed seeing within our group of students is that you find people with years of experience, like 15 years of experience working in permaculture or regenerative projects and people with like serial, serious experience or hands-on experience, or they're just, they're just, uh, they just joined the course for the, uh, you know, wanting to learn more about water. And I think everyone has really been able to learn from the course and actually gain a new perspective. So, um, if you already have some experience, I think there's always something to gain. And uh, so, yeah, I would encourage everyone to go for it, even if you feel like you've done a lot, just um, you might end up um, being surprised by what you can learn here. Yeah, I'd like to dovetail on that. I, I, what I've really appreciated in the course is during the professional development and stuff, getting to meet and hear people's stories from all over the world that are working on these issues and how universal the issues are and how somewhat simple and yet, you know, practical solutions are available to people. And so to, to have everybody's 
questions, whether it's from a beginner level or a more advanced level, they all feed into the, the dialogue that is so important uh, to, to resolve and, and bring this to a wider audience um, of people that have, have kind of, it's been pushing the, the world towards this drought fire, <laughs> um, you know, flood cycle of, you know, draining all the water away. And so we have to change that paradigm and people are coming at it from all different aspects. And to the to the money aspect of it, it's I I understand it's is seems like a lot up front, but you look at what you spend at going to a university or whatever, and then what do you do with that degree after that? And this is something that you can just hit the ground running, and one or two jobs it it'll, it'll pay for itself, um, you know, multifold over. And it's knowledge is something that you know once you have it it can't be taken away from you. It's not outsourced. It's, it's always there um, in your toolkit that you can access and utilize on a small scale or a large scale. I mean, it's totally scalable um, and applicable to a wide, um, a wide array of fields. So um, very valuable information and kind of puts it in a nutshell by going through this course. Awesome. Yeah, I um I agree. Um, the the money kind of um you know if you are living mostly paycheck to paycheck can seem very daunting, but it's definitely worth the spend. Um, I was trying to do this by myself without the course, you know, for years and years and years, and I can tell you, I probably spent a lot more, and it took a lot more time, and I didn't get anywhere close to the level of education, like. It's just a way to condense what you would do on your own. Um, and uh, it actually, you have a lot more, um, you get a lot more out of it because, you know, for me to achieve the same thing, I would have to travel to Austria and work, but it would have had to happen for me to gain these same results. So um, in a lot of ways, it's cheaper. But um, the thing I wanted to say to wrap it up for me was just um, the best thing I think I did is I came into it with no extra. I, I didn't have expectations as to what I was going to, what the result was going to be for me at the end or where I was going to end up. And so it, uh, a lot of what this course does is help you figure out. Um, and that was a huge part of it for me. So yeah, don't, don't think you have to have all the answers going in. Just If you know you want the information, that's kind of the only important part. So yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to add on, on what Judah said. I uh, uh, really agree with the no expectation kind of uh, setup. And and for me, I, I've always been kind of a, a self-learner. Like, ah, maybe I don't need a course because there's everything in the internet and I can find the videos and I will make it or whatever. So, uh, and, and I'm not, uh, uh, I don't usually take courses, uh, but this one, um, I think that not only the, the, the information and the detail of it, but also the, the having this space in which different people from around the world, we all have like the same issues. And that's like, and that was for me like a big, uh, I'm like slap in the face, like, wow, we're dealing with exactly the same thing that you see like in those other countries, like coming from a third world country, you don't think this uh, kind of things happen to the, in the first world country somehow. But we, we, it's it's such a, a, a kind of a humbling situation. The one we're facing is that like, and we're all in the same place and like in the same common ground, and and facing the same issues and and uh, seeing people from around the world addressing the same issues and and with all of like their, their passion and, and love for nature. In in for me, that that was the best part. Like. Uh, creating those connections through a common goal and having the instances for sharing those uh, thoughts, questions, processes, uh, techniques, and whatever. So if there's anyone like still doubting it, if there's anything you can do to go for it, I would say go for it. Like there's there's no chance uh, you will regret it. I mean, I, I can put my hands up for it. <laughs> Yeah, 
Um, I cannot say so much about the course itself because it's all said actually. <laughs> but what I want to say is that I really love the, to have this reconnection with the spirit and the bigger picture. Um, like today, uh, yesterday I read something about the rain that is passing by uh, my tiny country is finally ending up in Kazakhstan and China. So it's like, just to know what I am doing is going to affect, it's going to go around half of the world and it's, it's going to rain down there. It's just such a big thing to know, okay, I mean, it's just a small part that you can do, but it's, it has an impact <laughs> around the world. It's, it, uh, for me, it's amazing. And just to, to have this spirit again, ah, yeah. It's not just me, it's not just my place, it's not just my region, it's not, it's the, yeah, it's the whole world that you are affecting, and it's really great to have this spirit again. Yeah. Nice, y'all. Well, that was a lovely, lovely time with everybody. I appreciate each and every one of you for showing up, giving your time, giving your attention and hopefully going down this amazing journey of restoring your water cycle and your watersheds wherever you are, no matter your circumstances, whether you have land, whether you don't, whether you want to be professional at this or just do it for the sake of it. Um, it's a worthwhile road to go down. And you know, Zach and I and the whole Water Stories team are, are grateful for everyone who has contributed and who is part of this learning journey. Yeah, and thank you to all of our panelists here. You all are such wonderful people. Really appreciate you guys taking the time to join us. And uh, it's been really a pleasure to get to know all of you all through doing the course and look forward to seeing all of the amazingly positive waves you make out there around the world. Yeah. Well, ciao, everybody. Tschüss. Adios. Talk to you soon. <laughs>